sometimes it's like their guts are all over the canvas or the paper or whatever they used to paint on. And if they get rejected and somebody doesn't like what they've painted, they take it into heart very strongly. My father, Stephen Shrem, came to New York to pursue his dream of becoming a famous artist. His piece, Happy Buildings, almost got him there. But his art, along with his life, hasn't turned out much better than the two buildings at the center of his piece. Over the past couple of years, my father Stephen Shrem has become my obsession. I think of him every day and try to unravel the mystery of his life. As I was growing up, my dad was everything to me. He wasn't only an artist, but an incredible martial artist, musician, an accomplished chess master, as well as my best friend. He used to say to be humble and never think you're better than anyone else. So that's why I can't understand how he screwed up so badly. He was uh, artistic, he was creative. He was sensitive. He uh, wanted to get famous fast. Uh, Stephen wanted uh, to be uh, rich and famous any day now. <laughs> he was so young, so naive, so innocent, didn't have a penny, didn't have education, nothing. He had a cute smile, he was nice, he was young. We were both young. We were having fun. We were free. But there was absolutely no prospect for anything. And this is why we objected. And uh, they went and got married anyway. And with my blessing, we gave them a little wedding because she was going to do it anyway. Things worked out well in the beginning. My mom and dad were a team. She believed in his work and helped to build his career. And as a team, they were, uh, we sold an incredible amount of art. Uh, he was funny, he was crazy. Uh, and people liked that whole aura about him. In the beginning, he would make paintings and he was unsure of himself, so he would not tell people that he was the artist. And he was a very, very good salesman. As far as a promoter for his own art and everything, he was the best. He, he did his little song and dance and, and wouldn't let anybody walk by without showing them a second piece, a third piece. A lot of galleries who bought his art didn't know how to sell it. Oh, really? He was the best salesman. He was great. As far as the salesman was great, but, you know, other than that, everything else went downhill, so. By the time my little sister was born and I was seven years old, my father and his art was on a rise. But family life and the artist's life became hard to balance. Your mother put in a lot of effort to make it last. She worked very hard. She took over so he could play around and have his art and make a little money. But he was not responsible. He was the kind of guy that he'd want to work a few weeks and he'd want to take off and relax a few weeks and coast. People expected him to, you know, wake up in the morning and go to work, uh, you know, work all day, come home, you know, uh, bring home the money, uh, you know, and start over again. Your mother, when she was younger, she, uh, she went with him and she was the, the hippie bride and she was going with him to the West Coast and being what he wanted to be, being his, his, his Yoko Ono to his John Lennon, but later on, she decided to grow up, raise children, and be part of a community. And he came and he tried to do that, but he just, he never fit in with it. He just started getting very full of himself. His ego started growing because he was getting some fame and popularity from his artwork. He couldn't take any type, any type of criticism. Anything that we would say, uh, he would fight. Everything was a fight. He wanted to do everything but he couldn't do it all. I, I think he was in love with his art. That's what happens. And he wanted to be the artist, and he wanted to be the husband and the father, and he wanted to be the musician and the poet. And uh, he did a little of each, but he, he didn't do it all the way it should have been done. So, uh, like I said, at one time she was willing to do anything he wanted, but later on it was he had to do what she wanted, and he didn't want to do what anybody wanted. My father then started to become well known from a certain style of pictures he created. Pictures he called shremographs. A picture that had two sides to it depending on the way you looked at it. But 
But along with another side to his pictures, he created another side to himself. At one point of his life, he changed his name from Stephen to Stefan, and lashed out at anyone who called him Stephen again. When you call the name all your life and people use it, Stephen, you know, and they use it to, to yell at you or to degrade you or to put you down or, or to compliment you, the name becomes a, becomes a paddle. It becomes like something you can be hit with. So he changed his name and said, I ain't Stephen no more, I'm Stefan. He like, he like if he had a double personality, this would happen. It was like a, like a lizard, lizard um, a snake sh shedding its skin. For me, it was very difficult because I knew him for at least at this point by 12, 13 years as Stephen. And then to call him Stefan was a problem for me because I couldn't see it. On October 13, 1999, my father Stefan ran away to Paris with another woman. It was on my 10th birthday. In the beginning, it was really hard to see somebody, someone you look up to so much and like you spend so much of your life with to just like disappear all of a sudden. Without saying goodbye, without saying anything. Through no fault of your own, he went far away. He, he made the decisions. It was a month later and he showed up at the door and he didn't want to use his key. Um, I don't know, he knocked at the door and I opened the door and then he came in and he had his guitar slung over his back and he said, I'm 18 again. I said, really? That's nice. And then I walked away. Soon after, my father moved to Paris for good and everything fell apart and his career in the art world nearly ended. While I was making this film, I got a call. My father said he had a storage bin down in Jersey that he had neglected and couldn't pay off. He said that if someone didn't bring a thousand dollars to the bin by 9.30 a.m. the following morning, the bin would be gone. With the help of my mom, I took my bar mitzvah money and bought the bin. I didn't expect to find anything too valuable. I just felt that I couldn't let any of it go. The bin was a disaster. His artwork, his writings, his photos and his books have been thrown around and discarded like the people in his life, like me. It's all I have left of him, at least for now, but maybe forever.